As Ontario attempts to rebuild its economy, what role can a retooled manufacturing sector play? Here now to help us answer that question, Charlotte Yates, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Hamilton's McMaster University. Marie Laird, Vice Chair at the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, Toronto Chapter. Philip Cross, Research and Editorial Coordinator at the Macdonald Laurier Institute. And Ian Howcroft, Vice President of the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, Ontario Division. And it's good to welcome you all back to TVO. Marie, actually first time for you here. Nice yes. to meet you. Thank you. The CEO of General Electric recently wrote in the Harvard Business Review that outsourcing, quote, is quickly becoming mostly outdated as a business model for GE appliances. We also get the news that Apple is going to do some of its production back in the United States now. And I'm wondering, and why don't you get us started on this, Charlotte, I'm wondering whether after a decade of decline, has the case for shipping jobs overseas really changed for domestic manufacturers? I think there's been a significant number of changes that are contributing to what we might call insourcing now, that production is returning back to the U.S., uh, less so at least at the moment in Canada. Things like declining cost of labor, certainly in the case of the U.S., they're now what's called globally a low labor cost zone. Um, you get changes in oil prices uh, and al also in energy production as the U.S. becomes more self-sufficient. Therefore, that changes uh, the cost structure of manufacturing. The other factor is what impact uh, rising oil prices and transportation costs have on importing goods from China or from and therefore outsourcing your production to China but then what costs when you ship back and I think the final piece that we need to look at in this is what's happening to labor in other parts of the world of course at one time China's labor costs were so much lower that even when you added in the costs of transportation it still made a lot of sense whereas now as the Chinese cost of labor is going up uh, Chinese standards of living are going up. It means that the cost and the competitive advantage they once had is not so great. Ian, how much, uh, what was the word used, insourcing? Yeah. Insourcing or reshoring are we now starting to see here? I don't think we've seen a lot in Canada. We've had a few anecdotal incidents, uh, stories, but not a lot. What I hear more of, though, are companies uh, taking a look at where they should do their production. And I think what our focus is on retaining the manufacturing jobs that we have here, uh, making sure that we have a competitive environment for uh, Canadian and Ontario manufacturers to continue to produce and export to the, to the world. And I think we do have a lot to offer. There's a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of opportunities that we have to uh, be aware of. And I think one of the issues and challenges that we're dealing with is the whole image of manufacturing. I think many people have a very negative or pejorative image of manufacturing. And what we're trying to do is make sure people understand how important manufacturing has been and currently is to the economy of Ontario. It still is one of our largest sectors, depending on how you look at it. Still has 700,000 direct jobs in manufacturing. I think last year was about $275 billion in manufactured output. We've had uh, a real rebirth since the depths of the recession. So we have to get that message out so that we don't become that self-fulfilling prophecy that we start losing manufacturing because we're not doing what we need to do. Uh, society isn't doing what it needs to do. Educational institutions aren't addressing some of the concerns. And government isn't taking uh, some of the steps it needs to do to protect and grow manufacturing in Ontario. Marie, your view on the insourcing issue? Uh, I think it will, well, reshoring, as it's okay. more commonly known. Uh, I think it will happen in the U.S. Charlotte made some good points. Uh, you know, they're, they're seeing quite a few advantages that we don't currently, currently enjoy. Lower labor costs being one, uh, competitive dollar being another. The, you know, and, and we just don't have that in Canada. And I, I find in Ian's points a little more interesting in the sense that I think we've already lost manufacturing to a very large degree. Uh, we are a shadow of our former selves, and, and I would you know, say that it's not just a question of maintaining our current manufacturing status, but we need to actively grow it. Uh, and it's not just going to happen through exporting, because you know, some of our largest opportunities are facing incredible entry barriers, China being one great example of that. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, they're going to be very tempted to make their own stuff you know, as with this. So I think it's going to be very, very tough for Canada unless uh, we do get some of the players that uh, Ian mentioned a line, namely government, industry, and educational leaders. Philip, let me get you to finish out on that question. Well, I would agree. I think offshoring, per se, has very much run its course uh, because of the increase in Chinese wages and the reduction in energy costs in, in North America. Uh, I don't think, however, you're going to see a lot of those jobs that were offshore, particularly the clothing industry, the furniture industry, these low-wage jobs, they left and they're not coming back at any price. Where we're going to have growth going forward in uh, manufacturing in Canada, 
are uh, areas like uh, high wage, traditional high wage industries like the auto industry, uh, the resource based manufacturers are doing quite well, the capital goods industries that are feeding the machinery, uh, the steel, the pipelines needed for the expansion of the energy sector at West. That's where we're seeing growth and manufacturing in fact has been one of the leading industries in the recovery. Let me ask about image though, and Marie, maybe I'll get you to, to start on this one. Ian makes an interesting point that there, there are people who still have an image of manufacturing in this country as something done by incredibly low skilled, um, boring jobs, awful jobs, the jobs you wouldn't want. It's not that way anymore, is it? You've got to have a lot of skills and a lot of it's very, very high tech nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. There is an image problem here. There is a huge image problem. I think it's even worse than what you've outlined. You know, it's that dark, dirty, dangerous thing yeah. that nobody wants to go into. Um, and, you know, and, and I would say we're all guilty of it as a society. We have failed ourselves. Uh, even people involved in manufacturing have for many years said, you know, don't go into manufacturing, you know, go, go to school, get a good job, and by extension, you know, that meaning that a job in manufacturing cannot be good. Uh, you're absolutely right that, you know, in, as we move forward, um, and already so, manufacturing has changed. It's not, you know, that of the industrial age. You know, I think it's probably probably cleaner and more efficient than many people's households. So, it's um, it does require a lot of training. It uh, it is high paying, um, but, but Ian, there are that, still some challenges. Yeah, I think we know. With I mean, auto parts is so incredibly ro ro roboticized now. Is that the word I'm looking for? But even steel. I mean, st steel is not uh, every every manufacturing entity that's uh, going to succeed has to be practicing the tenets of advanced manufacturing. And the key challenge that we keep hearing about is the skill shortages. They can't get the skills that they need. And demographics being what they are, that uh, challenge is going to intensify over the next five or six years. Many uh, companies have uh, an aging workforce, 56, 57 is the average age, and, and they don't have the skill sets that are going to come in to replace these workers when they do leave. They may be staying a bit longer than they planned because of the recession, but they will be leaving at, at some point, and there's not the skill sets to replace those. So the tenets of advanced manufacturing, as opposed to what we traditionally think of, are more along the lines of what? Well, advanced manufacturing is manufacturers uh, that are going to succeed in the future. It, it's, uh, it's, it's high tech. And, and when you look at the steel industry, they've had to become very advanced in how they compete globally with the uh, steel manufacturers around the world. What has happened in manufacturing has been huge changes over the last 10, 20, 30 years and will continue to change. Manufacturing is an ev evolving uh, industry and sector and you have to keep in, in introducing new technologies, improving productivity if you're going to keep manufacturing here in Ontario and in Canada. Okay, Charlotte, help us with this here because uh, manufacturing obviously became the core of Ontario's economy many, many years ago because we've got so many things going for us here. We had low energy costs, we had good mm -hmm. transportation systems, we had tremendous proximity to the mm -hmm. American market, uh, good educated labor force whose health care mm -hmm. costs were paid for by the mm -hmm. public as opposed to um, mm -hmm. on, on the sticker price of the car type of thing. With all of those metrics, how do we stand today vis-a-vis -vis the United States? In terms of the, I mean, there are a couple of big dif um, differences that have happened. Certainly in terms of health care costs, we've seen uh, negotiations, particularly for the larger workforces in places like the automotive industry, where the cost of health care has been reduced by restructured plans in the U.S. So that competitive advantage that Canada once had is no longer such a competitive advantage. Um, issues around training, certainly on average, Canadian workforce is a much more highly educated and highly skilled workforce than you find in the US. But that's where I think we need to be careful that just because you have advanced manufacturing does not mean you don't also have low wages. I mean, you look at India. India is a country of high, I mean, has high levels of engineering sophistication and yet still plays low wages. So I think when, if you want to couple high wages and high skill, which I think is preferable, then you need that public policy link. And that's where I think uh, one of the biggest things that's changed in the United States is under Obama, they've introduced a series of pieces of legislation which has actually encouraged companies to relocate back into the United States, has captured some of the markets that they once allowed to be sourced elsewhere. And that's something that the Canadian governments have not yet been willing to do. We haven't done that. Why not? I think there's political resistance. I think um, if you look at the philosophies of the government of someone like Obama, which is he does not, um, he believes that you can use the state creatively to, comp to create American advantage, whereas that's not tended to be the case in Canada. And as a result, governments have not, for example, the Buy America policy. 
that had a huge impact in terms of a number of companies which relocated back to the United States because, in fact, in order to sell uh, to the U.S., they had to be bo uh, made in America. Yeah, but we didn't like that too much. No, we didn't. And it's not a policy which you can necessarily enact in Canada because we have a small market. Mm -hmm. But you do need active policy intervention in order to uh, create that competitive comparative advantage. Philip, where do you think we stand on all of those metrics I just mentioned? Well, I think the one that caught my eye the most was the uh, emphasis on having a highly skilled labor force in manufacturing. I don't think it's, it's appreciated, for example, how that's changed in the last 10 years, that uh, since 2000, uh, employment in by manufacturers of people with high school or less has dropped 30%. Okay. Mm -hmm. For those with university education, it's up 15%. You need a university degree to work in manufacturing these days. I think that would supply, surprise a lot of people. The days when you left uh, high school and got a good middle class manufacturing job, that peaked in the 1960s. That's been going out of style for 40 years now, and I think we really have to hit the update mm -hmm. on uh, people's perceptions about manufacturing. John, Can I follow? add just a little bit on that, though? I think we have to be careful about why that is the case. Is it that they're using the skills of university graduates, or is it because the wages are so much higher in certain sections of the manufacturing industry that, in fact, when you have a university degree, you're drawn to those sectors where there are higher wages and you crowd out those people who have got lower uh, levels of education. So I think it's a dynamic which we need to understand a little bit more clearly. Can I just get you on that, Ian? Is it your experience that you need a university degree to make it manufacturing nowadays? It depends what you're doing. Uh, and I, I would not uh, say anything negative about a university degree, uh, but I think you also look at the colleges as well. Colleges are producing a lot of excellent students that have a lot of skill sets that manufacturers need as well for, for technicians, and uh, a lot of uh, opportunities exist. Uh, and we're trying to build uh, more linkages with colleges and with universities to deal with these skill shortages. There's thousands of jobs that are going unfilled right now in manufacturing facilities all around the province. Like what? Yet, we, in, in some of the high-tech firms, you go up north and, and so the manufacturing of the processing and the mining, mining engineers, uh, a little broader than just the traditional manufacturing, but these jobs just can't go filled. There, there's a shortage around them globally, and we hear about this at uh, all the sessions that we're having as part of our manufacturing strategy. We're involved in engaging manufacturers across the province to identify what the key issues are, uh, what uh, manufacturers need from, from us as, as their uh, organization of, uh, of representation and of advocacy, but also what we can take to the government to affect and develop a better manufacturing strategy for Ontario. Just to make sure we're all on the same page here, let's control room. Can we put these numbers up here? This really, over the past decade, does tell uh, quite a tale about what's happening to manufacturing by the numbers. As a percentage of Ontario's economy, 10 years ago, manufacturing was almost a quarter of the economy. Look at 2006, it goes down to 17%. Look at where we are today, not even 12.5%. What does that translate to in terms of jobs lost? Well, back in 2004, we had more than a million jobs in manufacturing in the province of Ontario, and today we're lower than 800,000. That's a lot of families affected, that's a lot of lost jobs, that's a lot of misery out there. Are those... Marie, unambiguously bad numbers if you look at this from a manufa manufacturing point of view. Yeah, I think actually those, I was surprised to see the number is so high is that we still have 800,000 jobs in manufacturing. You thought it was worse. I thought, I think it is worse. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to how they, they count jobs. But, to, you know, to go back, I think it's a real trap to say that advanced manufacturing is advanced technology in manufacturing because technology is entirely portable. I mean, we've already offshored most of our, the technologies that took us three or four generations to develop, we gave away for nothing in the course of a decade or two. Um, and, you know, to say that now new technologies are going to be our savior and, you know, being better at them, everybody else is going to have them too, you know, and, and some countries already have more money to buy them and develop them than we do. Well, the reason I asked whether it was unambiguously bad news was yeah. because I, presu I presume there are some people who are doing some companies that are manufacturing that are, have more output, they're doing it with fewer people, they're making more money, I assume that's happening, and that's not unambiguously bad news. I think there are always exceptions to the rule, but I think the rule is we've been gutted. Uh, I think that you know, manufacturing has been removed from, the social fa from our societal fabric in Ontario. Uh, I think it's been removed from the social consciousness. It's no longer a focus of our government or of our educators or uh, even of the people, the populace themselves. And I think that it is unambiguously bad news unless we do, to Charlotte's point, start getting the policies in place, start getting industry and educational leaders 
uh, participating in that discussion and aligning things so that it can all come together. Again, I, making, I, think, yeah, sorry, I think one of the, the benefits, if there are any benefits from the recession, was it did elevate the debate around manufacturing. I think more and more people are talking about that now because of what we've lost and recognizing that we have to take proactive action now to save the 800,000 jobs and build that. And I think it's also important to note that for every manufacturing job, it uh, has another one and a half to two jobs uh, supporting uh, jobs, uh, spin indirect off. jobs, spin-off mm -hmm. jobs. In the, in the auto sector, I think it's seven or eight jobs for every mm -hmm. auto sector mm -hmm. job. So mm -hmm. I think you have to remember that part of the, uh, the equation as well. Well, this is where it does get a bit confusing because manufacturing today, yes, it's making cars and yes, it's making steel, but it's also biotech and it's mm -hmm. also pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So when you talk manufacturing, mm -hmm. Charlotte, you're talking about a pretty wide variety of stuff And now. even RIM. I mean, RIM and Statistics Canada, the big debate is that Statistics Canada doesn't necessarily capture all of the RIM, the open source jobs, which they would define as manufacturing, but which are in fact high-tech manufacturing jobs. But I think going back to your question about is it an unambiguous, mm -hmm. I agree with um, Marianne in that, in fact, there is a danger sign that if you lose that many jobs, it means you are losing some of your capacity. But if you look at industries like the steel industry, which has significantly increased its output, but been able to reduce its workforce Hugely. at a much more rapid rate. Yeah. So its, its output is massive compared to the number of people. So I think that those are indicators of a healthy manufacturing sector. But I think there are also danger signs that, in fact, if you lose, uh, there is a tipping point, if you will. Mm -hmm. And if you lose too many jobs, too much capacity, then, in fact, you don't have the, what I call the tight linkages which allow the spin-offs to happen. So, in other words, the uh, assembler invests, the automotive assembler invests, and with that, you get a series of auto parts makers who themselves innovate, create globally competitive products, which then are a series of spin-offs which you need, you need to have that core capacity before you gain those benefits. But I get it, I mean, presumably even simpler, let's go to our hometown of Hamilton here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think when I was a kid, there was probably 30, 40,000 people working in steel. Today it's 5,000. Yes. Now, it, it, you don't have to be a genius to understand how many fewer dry cleaners you need, That's or local right. restaurateurs you need, or yeah. you know car salesmen, or that kind of thing. That the, the, so while they may be more uh, profitable, the steel companies in Hamilton the social implications are really that's quite right. profound, aren't exactly. they? Exactly, and that's where I think you need to also, Canada needs to position herself so that she is not just reliant on the existing industries, but becomes competitive in emerging sectors, and in fact becomes a leader in some of the emerging manufacturing sectors, and that becomes the key to our future. And yeah. you also have to deal with productivity. We have a real productivity mm -hmm. challenge in Canada compared to most OECD countries in the United States. Uh, we need to invest in that. Uh, we have to produce more, and, and if companies are able to do that, they don't need the same workers. That, in one hand, is a good thing. It's not good for the workers that lose their jobs. That's why we need to, to continue to, to build manufacturing. And others around the world are competing for those jobs, those uh, world mandates, uh, those uh, facilities. So we cannot be uh, stayed. We have to do all we can to, uh, to, to move it forward. Let me follow up with something here that was in the New York Times a few months ago. Uh, get comfy, everybody. This is going to take just a little while to read here. <laughs> At the Philips Electronics factory on the coast of China, hundreds of workers use their hands and specialized tools to assemble electric shavers. That is the old way. At a sister factory here in the Dutch countryside, 128 robot arms do the same work with yoga-like flexibility. Video cameras guide them through feats well beyond the capability of the most dexterous human. One robot arm endlessly forms three perfect bends in two connector wires and slips them into holes almost too small for the eye to see. The arms work so fast that they must be enclosed in glass cages to prevent the people supervising them from being injured. And they do it all without a coffee break, three shifts a day, 365 days a year. All told, the factory here has several dozen workers per shift, about a tenth as many as the plant in the Chinese city of Zhuhai. This says John Markoff of the New York Times, is the future. Are we starting to see anything like this in the province of Ontario, do you know? I think it's there to some degree and has been there to some degree for quite a few years. But uh, in all honesty, it's one of the things that we took our eye off of. And this, you know, going back to my earlier comment, I mean, we've gutted the core of manufacturing. And robotics isn't new. You know, robotics has been around for a couple of decades. And the fact that we're not utilizing it the way we should be you know, is partially due to the fact that we thought we could throw everything offshore and just get it done that way. You know, we didn't sustain manufacturing at home. We just 
pushed it all out there. How come? <laughs> well, I think that's a very complex question, but I think a lot of it was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. it, you know, but there, um, how come? I think, you know, partially it was due to corporate, the, the structure of corporations, you know, they went seeking the, the cheaper, um, the cheaper product and, and higher profitability. They didn't have any um, responsibility to their local environments, to their, you know, to local societies that developed them, and, and we made it so. That's, and governments let them do it? And governments let them do it. And then there was a herd mentality. There was this, you know, back to one of the very first points, there was no assessment of the true cost of offshoring. People just thought, oh, low labor weights, uh, sorry, low labor rates, there we go. That's an easy math to do. They didn't understand that you know, oh, we're doing the calculation now when oil's at $20 a barrel and one yeah. day it's going to be at 100 They didn't understand that, you know, your people here in Canada are going to have to be up all night talking to your suppliers in China or wherever they may be trying to solve quality issues and everything else around it. I mean, there was just, there was a lot of uh, bad decision making and right now there are some economic policies that are sustaining it. You know, the low interest rates being one, they allow us to have a huge amount of inventory going back and forth around the world in these container ships. and. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's a it's a situation that we just we need to fix. I'm still getting comfortable, so weigh in on this some more if you would. Okay. I really don't agree with the characterization of uh, of manufacturing Canada as being gutted. Uh, it certainly, as always, was very hard hit by the recession. But as I said, it has been leading growth coming back. It's not creating a lot of jobs, and that's a different question. We may in the future, way down the road, have a manufacturing sector that looks a lot like agriculture today, where we have a, everything is produced by a very small number of people. That gets back to the quote you were talking about. But that's a different question. We'll still be producing mm -hmm. a lot of manufacturing goods in this country. They'll still be very important to our exports. Ontario is a bit different. Uh, almost every part of the country's manufacturing has completely recovered from the recession except Ontario. And that reflects that the auto industry is so very important to uh, Ontario's manufacturing sector. Even there, that industry's headed for its best year since 2002. I, but I'm really curious, you know, where, why you would defend that because, you know, I mean, I, I feel that, you know, I'm here in part just representing industry. You know, it's SME started to take back manufacturing movement and we've been engaging with people for the last year and a half specifically on this. I have not heard one industry person say anything to the contrary of the points that I've laid out. So I think, you know, and, and to, to Ian's point, you know, we've had a survey out there that has, you know, had over 500 participants and they have helped us identify what are their concerns. High dollar, you know, a, a low competitive environment. It's, it's all the things we've been talking about and they are all deeply concerned about the state of manufacturing and, it's, and where it's going. I think they think it's gutted. So it's interesting for me to hear someone who's not in manufacturing say, oh, no, it's not. But I think to say it's gutted, maybe I think if I can uh, interject here, to say it's gutted suggests then that you've gone too far down the road to in fact recover. Whereas I think if I can say there are still some really core areas where we have enormous capacity and potential. Like what? Um, I would say automotive is one, although the future prediction for Canadian automotive is not good in the global uh, scene. I mean, there are some statistics to suggest that we are one of the only major world producers that will not see a significant growth in its assembly of, man of cars anywhere. And that actually is worrying because then that means that our auto parts base shrinks. But there are other areas where Canada continues to have, I think, um, RIM is obviously in trouble. Um, I think pharmaceuticals, that market is significantly changing because of the changing market for uh, drugs in the first world. Um, I think there is potential around the mining and resource industries, which is actually underdeveloped. Canada mm -hmm. has remarkably low capacity in terms of machinery manufacturing, and yet one would think, given that we are a major resource ex uh, exporter and extractor, that in fact that would be an area where we should have a competitive if advantage. If we get that ring of fire going, or Quebec with its plan now as it gets going, that could be huge, couldn't exactly. it? Exactly, absolutely. So I think I don't disagree with you, uh, Marie, that there are um, warning danger signs, but I think Philip is right, is that there are also signs that some areas are returning, and that includes, oddly enough, things like furniture manufacturing, uh, some clothing manufacturing. You're starting to see, not on the mass scale, uh, 
but because also markets are changing. Because the other thing we're not looking at is, what, how is the consumer market changing so that it drives the demand for a different type of manufactured uh, good? We look at the value added. What's the contribution yes. that manufacturing is? You have to look at that, that value added. We just did uh, the survey, and uh, one of the things I was really pleased with, most of the manufacturers are very optimistic about the next three to five years. Uh, they, they are looking at this as a fairly robust opportunity for them, which is good. But it doesn't mean to say that there's no challenge. We have to deal with, uh, with, with the value of the dollar. We have to deal What's that with optimism based on, though? Uh, well, I, I asked that once. We are at a, at a round table. So well, how come you're optimistic? They said, well, we couldn't get up and do our job the next day. If we weren't optimistic, we have to think we're going to be successful. We have to think we're going to succeed. So, the, but they're also looking at what they think the, 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 uh, the forecasts are, what their, their growth opportunities are. Uh, they're looking to new markets. They're looking to, to expand. The United States has been our, our market still almost 75, 80 percent of what we export from Ontario goes to the United States. Uh, but we're looking now to, to, to Europe with, with new agreements there, to uh, the BRIC countries, to South America, to, to Africa, and companies are, are being more uh, adventurous and looking to these new opportunities more so than they've done in the past. And I think that's where the real growth opportunities are, and that was borne out in our survey as well. How much of manufacturing, though, still today looks like what it did in the 60s or 70s or 80s? I think most of it has probably changed dramatically. You'll, you'll get examples of uh, from the 50s or 60s, but those ones are not going to be the future of manufacturing. You're going to see more of those ones uh, uh, pass, uh, pass away, pass on, and companies have to embrace new technology. They have to be innovative themselves and uh, invest in new equipment, but they also need to invest in new processes, new ways of doing things, and new ways of marketing themselves and becoming part of a supply chain, a global supply chain, if they're going to succeed. And Charlotte, you admittedly have a conflict of interest on this next question I'm going to ask you, because you're at a university, and I'm going to ask you about community colleges. But do you think community colleges are doing a good enough job equipping today's students with the skills they're going to need in order to take those jobs that are lying vacant in the manufacturing sector? I think community colleges do a remarkably good job, actually. I think we have a very good system as a whole of uh, public community colleges who are fairly responsive to market needs and also build fairly close alliances with uh, industry partners in developing kind of a sense of what skills are needed. I think, so I think they're doing a good job. I think one of the dangers is that, for example, um, Ian, your point around, um, uh, I mean, I think you're looking really at the skilled trades. There are very, very many skilled trades in which we are not doing a good job. And partly that's about people not having, seeing this as a good job it's a uh, dirty job mm -hmm. or it's a lower social status job. And those are the things you have to combat because you don't just need the education system. You need people to see this as a good job, as something they would value. And I think there is considerable concern in the manufacturing sector, around less in auto um, than there is in other sectors, but around the training of those skilled trades. And I don't think that's a fault of the community colleges so much as it's a dynamic between also who wants to get that training. That's a society and cultural issue yeah. as well. Yeah. Young people not being aware of what those opportunities are, not being encouraged to consider a career in the skilled trades. And that's why we partner with groups uh, like, like Skills Canada, which uh, does thousands of in-school presentations every year and holds a huge uh, competition for skilled trades in, uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo every year that feeds into the national competition and the world competition. So a lot is being done, but a lot more has to be done to make sure young people are having the whole array of opportunities uh, made uh, available to them and I think we're trying to introduce a program that brings young people out to manufacturers for an experiential visit. I uh, also want to bring out teachers and guidance counselors because they need to know what manufacturing is all about in 2012 and beyond if they're going to be able to let young people in the schools know what those opportunities are. I'm interested in the feedback that you get on that because you know on career day or again when you have people come to the schools you know everybody whose dad's a lawyer or a doctor or you know the traditional thing that's the cool stuff right? What kind of feedback do you get from students on whether you want to go into manufacturing? A lot of it is uh, they're, they're really impressed, uh, fascinated, and uh, minds can be changed by looking at what those opportunities really are. You go to uh, uh, an office with a, with a parent who's a lawyer, that's a pretty boring uh, visit to, uh, to, for, for that student when you get in. Yeah, Journalism, yeah. too, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, Journalism, it's, uh, too. Yeah. <laughs> they come here and they watch me read all day But when long, you go to a, a yeah. manufacturing facility and actually see them making something, something that's mm -hmm. produced, uh, that can be exciting and a real game changer if you get them out there. Now that's a good point. But, uh, Marie, let me uh, follow up with you on that. Once upon a time, if we go back a quarter century or half a century, a manufacturing job was clearly a ticket to a good middle class existence, a couple of cars in the driveway, annual yeah. vacation, family home, that type of thing. I don't think youth, or I don't think young people expect 
that trajectory today? What should they expect if they want to go into manufacturing today? Well, I think right now, I mean, it's like, it's like many other jobs, you know, there's just less time. It's, uh, you know, single family income is uh, a rare luxury these days. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work, but I think to Ian's point, you know, manufacturing is cool. You know, there's many days when I think most of us can go to the office and at the end of it, we kind of go, did we do anything? <laughs> you know, but in manufacturing, you can see a very tangible result. And, and I think that's something a lot of people could relate to. Um, but you're an engineer. You don't have those days, do you? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of those days. You do? Uh, it, you know, but uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> in any case, um, you know, there's something uh, to be said, though, for this whole uh, societal image of manufacturing. That's, that's really what's controlling it. And I do, I do challenge, though, that the, the way that we are training people right now is sufficient. I don't think it's sufficient. I think, um, you know, and this is what we've put forward, what we need is an integrated apprenticeship program. And industry needs to be part of, uh, a very integral part of that. And I think industry has fallen down, uh, you know, and, and has tended to blame some of the educational leaders and why aren't you providing trained people? when really, you know, they're not out there working with educators to say this is what we need and this is how we want it and when we want it. So I, I think there's another side of this that industry needs to get more involved um, and I think people should go, to be honest, through an apprenticeship program right from high school and be able to start their training uh, and come out to be a technologist or a technician or uh, an engineer one day if they so desire. That but would require some change of policy. That would require uh, huge firm. changes of policy, but this that? is what we're talking about. I mean, and you know, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to drive the, maybe the conversation forward to, you know, we can discuss what is and debate it and everything else, but I, you know, I would much rather see a very proactive discussion on how do we fix it. Mm. And, and we what, need that, and, and, and we what's don't need needed. that. The average of age of an apprenticeship it. is 27. And, and you missed that opportunity. You need to get uh, young people to consider a career and apprenticeship uh, back when they're 16, 17, 18, not wait till they're 27 to start it. Otherwise, uh, it, it's too late for many. They don't mm -hmm. complete it. They Is don't finish it. Is that a federal it. thing or a provincial thing? Uh, it's provincial, but uh, I think the, uh, there's some provinces do better, but, uh, but a lot of provinces have that 26, 27 uh, average age for an apprenticeship. How are we doing at that? Where's 27? 26, 27, so that's lousy, average. Yeah, yeah, too late. We have to uh, do better as, uh, as a society in getting young people to consider those careers and start those uh, training opportunities earlier. And uh, I think we need to recognize, reward, and incent companies to do more training. But, but we also have to take into account uh, we need to have a public policy system that encourages that and, and allows for and promotes that as well. Here's sure. a problem. Okay, Marie. Sorry, here's a problem if people, you know, to Ian's point, go through the regular path, whether it be high school, college, high school, university, and, and they go to manufacturing or the, you know, whatever company. They get there and they don't know what they're doing because they've never actually touched some of the machinery that they're working on. The concepts, if you know, to our earlier points, if if a manufacturing company or industry is going to be competitive, they have to be leading edge in many ways. They have to be very current. And educational systems, not in all cases, but in most cases, lag that. It's just the nature of the beast I to some. I disagree with you on this. I, I think that there is so much evidence to suggest that the education system is working, but there are market incentives which are disincentive to training apprenticeships. I think. I, to, I do agree with that as I well. I think. Mm -hmm. I think that what, it's, you mean by that? what I mean by that is that <clears throat> I think if we let's take the example of the Waterloo hub around uh, training of um, mm -hmm. many of their engineers quite frankly we're training them to go to the US to be hired by Google because we do such a good job of training them I mean whole classes of uh, Waterloo engineering go down to the US and get jobs there because they're the trained the best of the best. We do hear that all so the time. We do Microsoft that, snaps right? them up. We do yeah. a very good job of training. We do a great job. The issue around apprenticeships is a little bit different. I mean, for companies to invest in an apprenticeship, when you have a highly mobile workforce, the problem is that you train an apprentice and then they get poached by another company. That has caused companies to, in fact, become a little gun-shy, if you will, because why would you invest 10 years or 7 years of training to the only to have your competition yeah. poach them for a dollar extra, which mm -hmm. is why there is a system in Ontario which has emerged, I think some colleges do it quite well, where they partner with industry so that the apprenticeship model is now different. It's not strictly industry based. It's a partnership between community college and industry because that way industry's risk is lessened from that. So I think, I think there are other dynamics at play that make it much harder to in fact train 
and move people through that apprenticeship system. And it's not strictly the individual choice, nor is it the in educational institutes. It's a, a kind of complex set of issues which you need to tease out and figure out how you provide the right incentives okay. and the right kind of structures. Well, time's flying here. We've only got a Sorry. few minutes left, and I got it. No, no, don't, don't apologize. I just <laughs> I want to make sure we get one more thing in here before our time runs out. The buck. Is there any way, Philip, that Ontario manufacturing can rebound if our dollar is worth what the American dollar is worth? Yes, and I think that's why what we're seeing already. Uh, manufacturing in uh, Canada has adapted to the reality, 10 years now, of a rising dollar and five years of a dollar at parity. It'd be uh, better if it were 80 cent dollar, though, wouldn't it? Sure, they would make more money, but they're not, that isn't necessary for them to survive. They've adapted their strategy twofold. They're less oriented to exports, and particularly U.S. exports, than they used to be. And at the same time, they've increased their use of imported inputs. Um, so by doing this, their net exposure to the exchange rate fluctuations is half of what it was a decade ago. Uh, this is what you would expect people to do when faced with these risks. And but you have to invest in productivity. I mean, if the mm -hmm. dollar is high, one way you can deal with that is to uh, introduce more lean manufacturing, lean tenants, and, and improve your, your, your productivity to, to help deal with that. But it is still a, an issue that, uh, that we hear about on an ongoing basis, but we're trying to make sure that we're providing our members, manufacturers, with the tools so that they can uh, better address some of these issues to improve the, their processes, to look to new ways of doing things, to building new markets. Yeah. Do you guys bother lobbying government, trying to tell the Minister of Finance, for example, can you get that buck down a bit? No, what, what we focus on is uh, the tax policy, uh, regulatory policy on environmental issues, uh, health and safety issues, to make sure we have the best lean regulatory system, not to, not to gut a system, but to make sure that the focus is on the results, managing the risks, not on process and paper burdens, and uh, that's what we've been focusing on. I guess I would, um, I think we have to be careful about that because if I think of environmental regulations, just going back to one of the things that Obama has done which shocked the world was to say a radical increase in uh, fuel efficiency for vehicles. Mm -hmm. And at first, the reaction is, my gosh, that's a terrible thing. Whereas guess what? It will incent a series of innovations which will allow the American uh, automotive manufacturers to become leaders in the world in terms of green. And I can say that that's only a trend which they'll then be able to export. And I think then you need a balance between regulations need also to lead the way in terms of incenting certain types of behavior that you can move ahead of your competitors. Okay. So and also getting out the realities as well. I mean, I think manufacturing, another image problem it has is they're viewed as uh, polluters. And if you look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the manufacturers in Canada have, have led the way. We have exceeded the Kyoto targets. Uh, manufacturing has done very well when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. Most people wouldn't re recognize that or realize that, mm -hmm. but, but it is. Uh, a reality that we have. We have reduced greenhouse gas emissions since 1991 by 11%, by notwithstanding manufacturing output increasing by about 80% during that time. How do you know that? I, I prepared for your show, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, but, Marie, but give us an idea. Just one thing about environmental impact. I mean, if, you know, something that doesn't get talked about is the environmental impact of, of shipping all of our raw materials over to the other side of the world and then bringing finished goods back. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those container ships it pollutes millions and millions worth of cars, you know, the same as millions and millions worth of cars every year. And we have thousands of them just circling the globe. I mean, if you take one of those off the water, you're going to have a greater environmental impact than you would with all of your green cars in North America, you know, hybrid or electric or otherwise. It's, you know, we have completely missed the ball in so many ways in terms of this whole notion of globalization being good for us. And I think that's what we really need to start wrestling with. It's not just about saving manufacturing. You know, there is also a bigger picture here of what is the economic model that we really um, can all benefit under. And it's not the current form of globalization. And Marie, you get the last word on today's program. Thank you very much for this thank discussion, you. everybody. I want to thanks to Charlotte Yates, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at McMaster University, Marie Laird from the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, Philip Cross, the Research and Editorial Coordinator at the McDonald Laurier Institute, and Ian Howcroft, VP, Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Thanks for a great discussion. Thank you very everybody. much. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.